Alhamdulillah, it's really wonderful to be able to speak about the women who are in the Qur'an as we are so close to the month of the Qur'an. Here we are in the month of Sha'ban, and the Prophet wasallam's famous dua began actually from Rajab, where he would say, Allahumma barik lana fi Rajab, wa barik lana fi Sha'ban, wa balighna Ramadan. Right? Oh Allah, put barakah, blessings, in the month of Rajab and put best blessings for us in the month of Shaban, which is right now, and allow us to reach Ramadan. And part of the ability to reach Ramadan and really make the most of it is to plan and prep ahead of time. So you have, have had the month of Rajab, and now you're currently in Shaban. And these are the weeks, honestly, in which you mentally prep, you physically prep, you emotionally prep, you prep the people around you, <laughs> especially as women. Right, this is when negotiations happen with family. Like, I am going to <laughs> focus in on my Quran this month of Ramadan. I am going to pray my Tarawih, inshallah, this month. I am going to try to do i'tikaf, whether it's at the masjid or at home. And I want you, inshallah, to feel empowered to do so because so many women, honestly, their Ramadan flies by. And there is a lot of service to others, a lot of feeding others, a lot of taking care of others, but very little of that turns inward to ourselves. But this month of Ramadan is ours just like it is for anyone else. Just like this deen of ours is for us, just like anyone else. And the Qur'an and the woman of the Qur'an we're going to speak about and you've been hearing about already are an example for both the men and the woman, inshallah. <laughs> And so I emphasize that greatly, and we'll probably talk about this later, maybe in the Q&A discussion. But truly, I want you, inshallah, to focus in on the message today that I'm going to share with you, because it is a message of Qur'an, it is a message of du'a, and it is a message of actually even fasting, which we'll touch on just a bit. I was asked by our organizers to talk on Hannah, who was the mother of Sitna Maryam. So you have two women. So today my talk is basically a two for one. Because it's very hard to talk about the mother of Maryam, except that you also speak about Maryam herself. And in addition, of course, her son, the grandson of Sayyidah Hana, who is Sayyidina Isa, right? The Prophet Jesus, peace be upon him. And so as we kind of think about the story from the Qur'an, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what we do know. And the reason I'm sharing with you about both is because I come from a tradition in which we do not speak about details that were not directly revealed to us, either in the Qur'an or in the Hadith. So there are speculations or there are stories that come from other religious traditions, other, tradition, other faith traditions that are not necessarily our own. And so what I'll present today is what is definitely known about Sayyidah Hana, which is not much. And from there, we'll talk also about Sitna Maryam. Make sense? Inshallah. So let us start from the very beginning here. There is an entire surah of the Qur'an dedicated or titled after the family of Hana and Maryam. And what surah of the Qur'an is that? Ala Amran. Exactly. The surah is literally called the family of Amran. And in the Qur'an, we don't actually have the name Hana. We have the title Imra'at Amran, the wife of Amran. That is how she's referred to by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whereas her daughter, Maryam, is the only woman in the Qur'an that is mentioned and has the entire chapter of the Qur'an named after her. SubhanAllah. Her place with Allah is very high. And to understand the beauty of Maryam, you have to understand who her mother was. And to understand the story of Maryam, you have to understand the woman who raised her. Right? So here's where we begin, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna Allah astafa Adama wa Nuhan wa ala Ibrahim wa ala Imran ala al-alameen. But indeed, Allah chose Adam and Nuh and the family of Ibrahim, and the family of Imran, above all other people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself says, these are the people he has chosen. 
to be the highest levels of people that we look up to and that we take example from. And notice here, he doesn't just mention the mother or the father or Maryam. He mentions the entire family, the family of Imran, which of course Sayyidina Isa would be part of that as well. And he mentions the family of Ibrahim, because you know that all of the descendants of Ibrahim, including our own Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is the family of Ibrahim. Right? So Allah says that he has really elevated these people. Now, if you look at what we do know from the hadith about Imra'at Amran or Hannah, the mother of Mary, here we have some narrations where you have, for example, Ibn Kathir in his tafsir says that her name was Hannah bint Tuqab, and she was unable to have children for a very, very long time. To, to a point that it became biologically very rare or unlikely that she'd ever bear a child. One day, and according to the narration that we find in Ibn Ishaq, the famous prophetic biographer of the Prophet وسلم, she was sitting one day under the shade and she saw, and this is such a beautiful story, she saw a bird feeding its little chick. And something entered her heart. And for women who have not been able to conceive or have had a difficult time in conceiving, this is a very real and painful journey. This entered into her heart, this feeling of, I wish I had a child too. And she made a very sincere dua. But she knew how rare and almost biologically impossible to be for someone like her at her age to have a child. And so she said, and here we know from, now we read from Surah Ali Amran. إِذْ قَالَتِ امْرَأَةُ عِمْرَانَ رَبِّ إِنِّي نَذَرُتُ لَكَ مَا فِي بَطْنِ مُحَرَّرًا فَتَقَبَّلْ مِنِّي إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ she said, this is the wife of Amran, mother of Mary, said, My Lord, indeed I have pledged for you what is in my womb, consecrated, meaning only for your service. So accept this from me, for you alone are the truly all-hearing and all-knowing. I want you to take a look at this dua that she makes because it's such a sincere dua, especially when you think about, maybe this is not your dua per se, but when you think of any dua that you've made where you know it's really kind of far-fetched that it's going to come true, that you're not sure that that dua is going to be answered, that it seems like you've made a dua before and all those years it hasn't come to pass. And yet you keep on making dua, wondering if Allah is listening to you, wondering if Allah cares, wondering if Allah is actually going to answer it. Sometimes we make dua very half-hearted, kind of like, I don't know, he hasn't answered it so far, why should he answer it now? Or is it even worth making dua? I'm asking for the impossible. Forgetting that Allah who fashioned us and created us and decide anything he wants, and change anything he wants, and make anything he wants come to pass. And so we learn from the tafsir that they made, that when Sittina Hana made this dua, it was not a half-hearted dua. It was a sincere dua. So sincere that she said, if it were to come to pass, I'm going to take any, whatever is in my womb for you, Ya Allah. Meaning what? What does this word muharraran mean? What does that word even mean? In the tafsir, they say that the Arabic of this word muharrara is translated as devoted to your service, preoccupied only with the hereafter, having no interest in the dunya. In serving Allah's house, and worshiping with great devotion, 
and one whose worship is not tainted with worldly aims. She basically was saying, if you give me this child, I will take nothing from this child. I will not ask it the way parents ask children to do things for them or to be for them or to take care of them or to pay for things for them or you should do this career or you should do this thing. I will ask nothing of this child. This child is for you and for you alone. And if you give me this child, this child will go straight to what was then, right, the place of worship. This is how sincere the du'a was. Who has the guts to make a du'a like that? Which mother? Our teachers, when I was studying this tafsir with my own teacher, a woman teacher, it was very interesting. And she said, do not make this du'a. <laughs> and I said, but it's in the Quran. <laughs> how come? And she said, this is not a du'a to be taken lightly. This is not something you just say. I'm going to make what's in my womb muharrara. And then you ask all these things of your child. This is a very special situation. And there are some who might be able to do this, but it is rare. And so, when she made this du'a, and very shortly thereafter realized that she was pregnant, what we know is that her husband, Imran, did not last to see the pregnancy all the way through. He died early. He died. And so when she came to give birth to this child, she was a single mother. That too is very important. And she will share this with her daughter. And when you think about what all of this means, kind of the step by step by step as we're explaining here, it is not as simple. But let's look at how generously Allah answered this dua. Several things. Number one. Number one is he answered the dua. Dua sometimes is not answered immediately. And sometimes when it is answered, it's not answered with what you ask for. Sometimes it looks so different than what you've asked for. But Allah knows best what you need at that moment and at that time. And sometimes you will never see the du'a answered, but it's kept for us on the Day of Judgment, either as a reward in and of itself, or that it repels, it literally is like a shield that repels something bad that was coming your way. There are so many ways in which du'a is answered. In this particular case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to answer her du'a. So he gives her a child. And secondly, she's very pleased upon delivery then is shocked. <laughs> she didn't say boy or girl. She just asked for a child and assumed if it's going to be something consecrated for Allah and is going to worship in the temple, then it has to be a boy. <laughs> in that era, and people would say till today, that is true. How do you make what is in your womb consecrated to Allah? Maybe a girl. Oh. Now look closely at what she says because here too it is very important that when Allah sends you the answer to your dua but it looks different than what you thought it would be, how you react is actually what matters. How you react. Do you push this away? Do you get so upset? Do you say, this is not what I wanted, right? Or I know better. Look what she says. فَلَمَّا وَضَعَتْهَا قَالَتْ رَبِّ إِنِّي وَضَعَتُهَا أُنْثَا وَاللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا وَضَعَتْ وَلَيْسَ الذَّكَرُ كَالْأُنْثَا وَإِنِّي سَمَّيْتُهَا مَرْيَمَ وَإِنِّي أُعِيذُهَا بِكَ وَذُرِّيَّتَهَا مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ When she delivered, she said, Oh my Lord, I have given birth to a girl. Not why did you give me a girl. She's merely stating the facts. Merely stating the facts. In a different surah, in a different time, 
we'll find, for example, you have Prophet Yaqub, who also has a very difficult time, taking a quick segue here, a very difficult time with what's happened with his son Yusuf being taken away from him, and crying and crying and crying and crying. And the Quran says he was in so much grief that his eyes turned white with grief. And yet when he talks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he too, if you look very carefully at how he talks, he states the facts. He doesn't complain in the way of objecting to Allah. He complains with the facts. Innama ashku, ashku, literally, I complain. Ashku, shakwa, complaint. Innama ashku, bathi wa huzni in Allah. I complain about my grief and my intense sadness to Allah. But he didn't object. There's a difference between shakwa, complaint, and between i'atirad, which means objection. He doesn't object. He complains with the facts, because that is permitted. People say, you can complain to Allah? <laughs> yes, just like every person in the Qur'an, with the facts, you state the facts. And yet, Allah, I am not objecting to what you sent me, but I am complaining about how difficult it is for me. This is okay. But pushing against the fate and saying, why me and how come, that is not okay. So what does she say? She says, My Lord, I have given birth to a girl. And Allah fully knew what she had been given. <laughs> he knows what he sent her. But she's, you know, stating the facts. And then she says, And the male is not like the female. We could probably spend all the conference talking about just this part of the verse. But we won't. That has to be for another conference. But it is so important to understand that there is differences between men and women. And it's right here in the Quran. And this does not mean one is better than the other. They are different. And let me tell you how it is, because then we're going to understand what happens to her child. So it's in a medium. And then she says, the male is not like the female. I have named her Mary. And I seek your protection for her and her offspring from Satan the accursed. I want you to really think about how it is that this statement is said, the exact wording of what she says, because there is nothing in the Quran that comes haphazardly, coincidentally, mistakenly. Every word has its meaning, every letter is measured, and everything has a deep, deep meaning to it. And in this Ramadan, take a quick segue here, in this Ramadan, I hope, inshallah ta'ala, that you're going to really take some time to contemplate and to ponder upon the Qur'an, tafakkur and tadabbur of the Qur'an. My dear sisters, if you don't make the time and you're just doing a khatim or a recitation quickly, <laughs> and trying to get from one cover to the other, that is not tafakkur and tadabbur. That is not pondering and contemplating on the deep meanings of the Qur'an. Every word has its measure. So we tell sisters, try to do a khatim, sure, in which you're trying to get from cover to cover. And try to do another khatim in which you're truly contemplating its meanings. And if you need to read its translation and listen to those who are giving you, right, the tafsir or the explanation, the exegesis of the actual verses. Wallahi, your heart will grow so much fonder to the Qur'an. You'll be so much more connected to the Qur'an. It is a kind of thing that if you kind of allow it to be shallow and surface, it's another book on the shelf. You pick it up from year to year, dust it off a little bit. But it's not something that speaks deeply to you. It's not something that's yours. It's not something where you connect and say, ah, the dua of Hannah or the Dua of Maryam that comes, of course, in Surah Maryam. Or even being able to pick up some of the nuances, like, wow, they were talking about a complaint with facts, but not an objection. 
or that duas, even when they seem far-fetched and a pie in the sky, Allah can still answer them and will at his wisdom. The when and the where is up to him. So is the how, and so is the why. <laughs> My dear sisters, I want you to really take some time this Ramadan with the Qur'an. We'll come back to this verse in just a moment, but take some time with it. And I want to also tell you, I'm going to put in a plug here if that's okay. This is a women's conference. I don't know how many sustained other women's programs, maybe there will be, I'm sure, inshallah ta'ala. But I invite you. I invite you to, uh, you have two big women organizations being you know, represented here with the women teachers and scholars who are coming today, the Rahma Foundation. A few of us are here from the Rahma Foundation. And I hope, inshallah, that you take the time to attend our Friday night halakas, which are open and free, and zoom in. You can zoom in. You don't have to drive all the way to Pleasanton, <laughs> inshallah. And also, the Rahma Ramadan programs, which so many sisters have said, alhamdulillah, they've truly benefited from. They happen all throughout the month of Ramadan, including in-person Qiyam layl and also Qiyam that happens by virtual, virtually by Zoom, where we host so many women scholars from across the U.S. and internationally. You get to hear and hear about so many of them and hear them speak and do reflections of the Qur'an. You hear them recite the Qur'an and you hear them do the explanation and you also hear them sing nasheed. Inshallah. All kinds of upliftment, mashallah. I want you to tune into that, inshallah. If you don't follow it already, if you're on social media, follow the handle at the Rahma Foundation. And also, the reason I said this about the Quran, make time to take your own Quran classes, please. Make that time. Find teachers. You have Dr. Haifa coming soon after me, and she's got the Jannah Institute. Make time for that. You have Ustada Maryam, who's coming, I think, right after me and has the Qari'a app. A shout out to her, neither of them asked me to do this, but I'm doing this here now because they're not here in the room, I can do that. But also because last Ramadan when the Qari'a app was launched, I enjoyed it greatly. And I listened to women Qari'at recite the Quran and followed along their khatim, right? When they were reciting, right? And yes, it's fine to listen to male reciters. There's no issue in that. But there's something so empowering to women reciters something so empowering to hear your voice reflected in it. There are some men in the room, but I was going to, all these verses I was going to read to you <laughs> as actual recitation, not just reading. Um, but I don't read in front of men. So, mashallah, may Allah bless the brothers who are recording for us. But, you know, alhamdulillah. I was going to read to you in the qira'at, right? In the actual 10 narrations of the qira'a, because some of the verses that we presented today are so beautiful as you hear the different narrations from the 10 qira'at. That is something, if you've already done your good tajweed, kind of you're really good at it, then take some time to do the qira'at. If you've done the qira'at, take some time to learn tafsir. If you've done tafsir, take some time to actually enroll yourself in sharia classes, one after another after another until you're actually completed your studies. I'm taking a total segue, but I'll be speaking from the heart because I feel the story is important and so nuanced. But how, as women, do we understand the nuance if you haven't studied, if you haven't accessed the Qur'an and haven't accessed the actual tafsir? And every woman you're going to see here, inshallah, as they all come one by one by one and then sit on the stage, with the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, each one has had her ability to study her various studies. And we're all just sisters like you. There's nothing that makes us special or different. I empower you and encourage you to do the same. Sign up for your classes one by one. Work on your Qur'an one by one. Inshallah, there's more to say, but I think I'm segueing too much. <laughs> but I feel so strongly about that. And as Ramadan comes up, make an intention. Say, Ya Allah, this is the month of the Qur'an. Allow me to be a woman of the Qur'an. Allow me to be someone who understands your Qur'an, someone who reads it perfect perfectly with the Qur'an and Tajweed. Allow me to be somebody who actually implements it in my life. Allow me to be and choose any person that you hear today from the woman of the Qur'an and ask to be like her. Find your role model. Is it Hannah? Is it Maryam? Is it any of the other women who are presented? Find your role model and say, Ya Allah, make me like her. SubhanAllah. May Allah accept. Say Ameen, please. Allahumma Ameen. I love you all so dearly and I really hope, inshallah, you'll get this. With the dua, even if you find yourself thinking that's a pie in the sky, so was Hannah thinking the same, but she made a resolute dua. And so we'll continue, inshallah, 
shortly hear what she was saying, so you have a, a full idea of the rest of the story. When Satina Maryam, her daughter, was born, and of course born a girl, <laughs> inshallah, now comes a little bit of a complication. How do we allow her? How does she become a person who is going to be fully consecrated to the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the temple? How? How is that going to work? SubhanAllah. And so, here what we find is a couple of really beautiful things. She names her Maryam. And in the tafsir, it says there are two translations of this word Maryam. One is that a woman of amazing strength. And oh yes, Satana Maryam is going to need a lot of strength to handle what's going to come next to her in her life. The other one says that she is equal to the woman who is equal to two men. <laughs> she is the only woman who birthed without a man. And she is equal to two men. SubhanAllah. The Prophet wasallam said about Satana Maryam, that the dua of her mother, Hannah, when she made the dua and said, Oh Allah, protect her, protect the progeny from shaitan. The Prophet ﷺ said this dua was so powerful that the shaitan could not touch Maryam or any one of her progeny, which is Sayyidina Isa. And the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ says, No person is born except that he's pricked by shaitan, and he cries by the touch of shaitan except for Mary and her son. So there's another dua, super powerful, right? Everything she asks for comes with difficulty, but it comes. And the ayahs continue. فَتَقَبَّلَهَا رَبُّهَا بِقَبُولٍ حَسَنٍ وَأَنْبَتَهَا نَبَاتًا حَسَنًا وَكَفَّلَهَا زَكَرِيًّا so here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, explains to us what happens to this dua of Anna. He says that her Lord accepted the dua, right? He accepted what she asked for with good acceptance and caused Maryam to grow in a good manner. And he put her in the care of Zakariya. Now, it turns out, this is such an interesting side story here about Zechariah. It turns out that Hannah and her sister, Hannah is married to Imran, and her sister is married to Zechariah. So Zechariah is the, basically the, the husband of her maternal aunt. And this is so beautiful because Zechariah is already in the temple. And so when she now needs to send this girl, the first time it's ever happened to send a girl to worship in the temple and to be there all the time, she has somebody already in the temple who is her family member. But it also doesn't come easy because in another part of the Quran, there is a discussion around how it is that Zakaria is even chosen. Because everyone says, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this girl. <laughs> I don't know what to do with a girl. I don't know what to do with a girl. I don't know what to do with a girl. So they say, fine. All of you cast your pens, cast your pens into the water. And whoever ends up with the pen that floats is the one that has to take this girl. <laughs> because they, they don't know what to do with a the girl. They're all men. Like, they don't know what to do with a girl. SubhanAllah. So they all cast their pens in. And the only one that floats to the surface is Zakariya. And Allah has this already figured out for her so that she is in good care and good protection. And so here she is, right? This is a lesson number two here of our three lessons. That provision comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You make your dua, right? but you don't know. How is it actually going to work out, <laughs> right? But here is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala making it work out. And everything falls into place because you have Zakaria, right? Who's the husband of our maternal aunt and is able to take care of her. And as she grows up, she spends a lot of time, Satina Maryam, spends a lot of time secluded in worship alone. And she's worshipping Allah, worshipping Allah exactly as her mother Hannah asked her to or made the dua for her to. And now you have beautiful parts of the surah that come from Surah Maryam that explain what happens. Well, what happens to little Maryam? What happens to little Maryam? So here we understand 
كلما دخل عليها زكريا المحراب وجد عندها رزقا قال يا مريم أنا لك هذا قالت هو من عند الله إن الله يرزق من يشاء بغير حساب And whenever Zachariah would enter upon her to see in her room what, what's happening, checking on her, he would find her in worship. And he would find that she has rizqa. Basically, they say it was, the tafsir says it is fruits that were out of season. How do you have fruits that were out of season? This is not America, folks. <laughs> you have fruits in the supermarket of all seasons. Fruits out of season. And so he realized. So he realized that this is from Allah. And he asks her, Maryam, where did you get this from? <laughs> And she says, Hada min right? It's from Allah. Okay. It just appears, it comes from me. Allah is the one who gives the provisions. He figures everything out, he puts it in the place it's meant to be, and he gives the provisions. And so here she is with fruit out of season, so much so. That Zechariah, who also didn't have a child, enters into his heart, oh Allah, give me a child too. <laughs> right? right? Maryam is so special that he's like, I want one of them. <laughs> I want one too. SubhanAllah. And that's a different surah in a different place where we understand that he makes dua also for a child. And who does Allah give him? Yahya. Right? Yahya, subhanAllah. Who was the cousin of Maryam. And so here, as we continue, inshallah, he says that this statement of Maryam understanding that this rizq, this provision comes from Allah, right, is something that only uh, Allah can give you. And even the idea, of, even the fact that uh, her uncle Zakaria was able to have a child, Yahya, is also miraculous because he was so old at age. So it's miracle after miracle after miracle coming for this family. And lastly, the third lesson I wanted to share, inshallah, from this verse is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is capable of everything and anything. And what I mean by that is when you look at Satina Maryam and the rest of her story, when you see, for example, the story that all of you know, right, that after some years and years of worship as being known as the most pious, the most chaste, the most amazing, the most uh, dutiful uh, woman, she receives her greatest test. The very thing that is opposite to what she is. News that she's going to bear a child with no man having ever touched her. And no one outside in the outside world, the outside community is going to understand that. And that is a massive test. And so when this happens, she is in worship, as she normally is, in her corner, in her room, worshiping. And here it says, وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ مَرْيَمَ إِذٍ تَبَذَتْ مِنْ أَهْلِهَا مَكَانًا شَرْقِيًّا فَاتَّقَذَتْ مِنْ دُونِهِمْ حِجَابًا فَأَرُسَلْنَا إِلَيْهَا رُوحَنَا فَتَمَثَّلَ لَهَا بَشَرًا سَوِيًّا And mentioned in the book, the story of Mary, when she drew from, withdrew from her family to a place in the East, and she screened herself off from them. And we sent to her our angel Jibreel, appearing before her as a man, perfectly formed. Can you imagine? Put yourself in this. You are in worship in the temple day in and day out, every day of your life. That's your, that's your life. That's what you do. You are, like your mother's dua, muharrara. You are consecrated to the temple, to the worship of Allah. That is all you have ever done. And suddenly the strange man that you don't know shows up and appears in your room. Right? And so she... is really worried. قالت إني أعوذ بالرحمن منك إن كنت تقية. She says, she says, I seek refuge from Allah. From you. Like, who are you? What is this? <laughs> What are you doing here? Right. قال إنما أنا رسول ربك لأهب لك غلاما زكيا. He says, I'm here to give you 
word or tidings from your Lord that you're going to bear a son. Like her mother before her, completely shocked, right? This is not, I mean, she's worshiping Allah all day. And I want to pause here for a minute and say, you may be thinking these are people so perfect, so amazing, so far from me. How could I even compare myself to them? But think about the human emotion for a minute. The concept of empathy. Empathy is when you put yourself into the shoes of someone else, when you feel what they're feeling. I ask you to put yourself in the shoes of Maryam for a moment. Put yourself in her shoes for a moment. Think about how you've been in the temple all your life, worshiping, worshiping, worshiping Allah. I have women who come to me in counseling often and say to me, I pray and I fast and I make dua and I do everything Allah told me to do. But he's not listening to my dua. Or what I asked for hasn't happened. Or some terrible thing has happened. How come? Why? Am I not a good Muslim? Is Maryam not the best of all women? I ask you, is Maryam not the best of all women? Do you or I worship like Maryam worships? Yet when she gets this news, when she gets this news, does she say to Allah, why me? How come? Didn't I pray to you for all these years? Hmm. My sisters, my sisters, I'm pausing here for a minute. Yes, these are stories in the Quran that we learn from. But with that empathy, put yourself in the shoes for a minute. And think about when the last time you were really upset and said something to the effect of, but I pray, but I wear hijab, but I'm trying to raise my family right, but I try to do right by Allah, but I don't lie, but I don't steal. How come? Or maybe you didn't say it in words, but your heart was rejected. Your heart was upset with Allah. I ask you again, are you or I more of a worshiper than Maryam? The best of people, Allah tests. And there is real human grief and sadness and difficulty that all of the people close to Allah, the prophets and the women of the Quran, have all faced. They are mentioned there, including their human emotions, so that we know to stop telling each other, you can't feel this grief for this long. To stop saying to each other, get over it already. To stop saying to each other, go pray more. Your dua isn't strong enough. Your iman isn't strong enough. Allah forgive us and what we say to each other, what we say to our sisters, what we say to our children. May Allah forgive us. Truly. Maybe this is on my mind and I'll put another plug if it's okay. Yesterday and the day before, alhamdulillah, we finished recording a series for Ramadan. For Madistan, which is the nonprofit organization and part of a holistic mental health nonprofit. And it's a series in Ramadan, this Ramadan going to be called Embracing Resilience. The stories of the trials and tribulations in the Qur'an. Hopefully you'll tune in. Yeah, please, please subscribe to Madistan and tune in, inshallah. Follow it all through Ramadan, please. Because we go through each of the stories of the Qur'an and pull out the trials and the tribulations that have happened to people so much better than us. And we talk about how it is they embraced resilience so that we can embrace resilience. Wallahi, they are not, we are not better than them. You understand what I'm trying to say? And so in closing, in just wrapping up here, the remaining part of the story of Satina Maryam, when she says to this man that's appeared in her room out of nowhere, right? And she says, قَالَتْ إِنِّي أَعُوذُ بِالرَّحْمَنِ مِنْكَ إِنْ كُنْتَ تَقِيَّةً Right, 
ولنجعله آية للناس ورحمة منا وكان أمرا مقضيا She said and wondered how can I have a son when no man has ever touched me nor am I unchaste and the archangel Jibreel in the form of a man replied so will it be your lord says it is easy for me and so he will make him a sign for humanity and a mercy from us it is a matter already decreed as in to say allah has willed and he has already decreed what is going to happen here don't push against qadr don't push against fate if allah has willed it for you and for me you can say Ooh, this is heavy. But don't say, why me? Why this fate? How come? Make it go away. You see the adab and the etiquette with dua. Through this story, we learn so much about the adab of dua and the kind of duas that are being made here. And of course, we know how the story ends, and I'm going to wrap it up here quickly to say that she gives, she's told about a son, and we know who the son is going to be, right? Sayyidina Isa, who is unlike any other human who has ever come to earth. And until today, just reflect on this for a moment. Until today, you have people across the entire earth who pray deeply, maybe misguided, but to Jesus. And in his name, and call upon him and make dua through him. And you have the Muslims who, inshallah, have a more correct understanding of who Sayyidina Isa is, also calling, right, understanding who he is. You have the majority of the world between the Muslims and the Christians understanding and loving and revering Sayyidina Isa. It is something amazing. This pain, this difficulty that his mother went through resulted in one of the most merciful people to all of humanity. A person who has given so much solace and light and love to humanity, subhanAllah. So sometimes when your dua, when the tribulation that happens to you seems so <laughs> difficult and so unlike, you can't even imagine how is the story going to even end. It ends amazingly. I'm not sure if this is a message or how we're doing. And so, so we're good on time, then I'll say this about Sayyidina Isa, which is so amazing. When you think about the, the lineage here, you have his grandmother, Sutana Hana, who we just started off with today, his mother, Maryam, and you have Sayyidina Isa. And you have the story in which she has an amazing amount of resilience that she has to pull through to deal with the people who are going to talk against her. In one of the Madistan videos, I guess I'm giving you a sneak peek, we talk about slander. We talk about when people call, say things about you that are untrue. We talk about the difficulty of people not understanding you. And so much so that she says to them, right? Allah says to her, be silent. Don't say anything. Don't say anything to them. Literally fast from speaking. And the people say to her, well, how are we going to understand what you're trying to say? She just points at the baby. And one of the miracles of Allah, of course, happens because Sayyidina Isa, as a baby, speaks and defends his mother. She doesn't defend herself. He defends her. And it's a miracle. And everyone watching, can you imagine everyone watching this? Right? Going, what on earth? SubhanAllah. Slander. Backbiting. Horrible lies about you. People saying that you are in this case, unchaste, or maybe they say whatever they say, but it's untrue. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts deeply. And she had to leave. She lived all her life in that temple, all her life in that temple, worshipped and worshipped and worshipped and worshipped. And yet it was so much that she couldn't stay there. And the Quran says that she had to go away, somewhere else, far from them, far from their words. And sometimes you have to do your hijrah too. Sometimes the bullying or the lies or the difficulty so much that you have to pick your child up out of that school and put them in another one. Sometimes. And when she did that, now comes the pain 
and the pangs of childbirth. And for those of you who've been through childbirth, you know, but imagine having no one near you. No doula, no nurse, no doctor, no husband to squeeze his hand. <laughs> nobody, nobody. Nobody reading put on for you on the side or in the room or outside of the room. Nobody, nothing, nobody. You are by yourself. Literally under a palm tree, by yourself. Allah is the one who sends provisions. So when the pains of contraction come to her, he also sends to her flowing water to drink from. And when she delivers the child, Sayyidina Isa, you're weak, you're exhausted. If you've delivered, you know what I'm talking about. You can't even see in front of you. Inshallah. You're so tired, so tired, so tired. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells her, get up and shake the palm tree. Have you ever tried to shake a palm tree? Next time you see one, <laughs> please give it a try. And if people think you're being nuts, tell them, my prophet, my prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he heard the tree stump that he used to lean on to give his khutbah, when they moved the masjid around and they had to uproot or move the tree stump or move away from the tree stump, the Prophet wasallam heard it cry. Because the tree stump was, stump was so sad that he wouldn't be able to uh, lean on it as he was getting up to the minbar to give his khutbah. He heard it cry. And they say it's audible that he went to the tree stump and hugged it. One of the shiuch said, our Prophet Muhammad was the first tree hugger. <laughs> so if you want to be a tree hugger too, it's sunnah. <laughs> so find a palm tree, empathy. Try to shake the palm tree and see what happens. Try, I want you to try, homework assignment. Because it is not easy. And if you've just delivered and you are a depleted and you're completely by yourself, so it's emotional and physical depletion, and, you try, and then Allah reveals to you to, sh to shake the tree stump, what energy do you have to even get up or to shake the tree stump? But Allah is the provider. And as she shakes the tree stump, what happens? The dates fall down. And until this very day, dates are so nutritious. And the fiber and all of the great nutrients that are in it are said that a pregnant and, and breastfeeding and postpartum woman and peripartum should actually use in all women, all, all people. <laughs> right? Dates are amazing. But there's something very special. Do you remember how we said earlier that Sayyidina Maryam, that Sayyidina Zakaria, when he would walk in, he would find out-of-season fruits. Do you not think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have just dropped the dates for her? Right in her lap? If he wanted to? Why shake the palm tree? We have to do our part. Sisters, we have to do our part. So the earlier statement I made about, please sign up for the classes of your, that encourage and continue your deen. Take one per semester. Class by class. Sign up here for something with Qur'an and Tajweed. If you can't find it here, find it online. If you can't find it in this message, go to that message. If you can't find this, find that. If you doesn't, it's not your cup of tea, try the next thing. I'm telling you, sisters, I feel so strongly about this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us Maryam in a postpartum state to shake the palm tree, to receive the dates that are going to nourish her and help her. We have to do our part too. You can't just sit here and say, osmosis. <laughs> this deen is not taught by osmosis. And anything that comes that is of worth comes with some pain and with some difficulty. Yeah? You agree with me? Inshallah. Again, again, don't leave the conference here today. Inshallah, you're inspired by all of these great speakers you're hearing. Don't leave it without making the intention, Ya Allah, make me a woman of the Qur'an. Ya Allah, make me like the women who are mentioned in the Qur'an. Those who, when they make dua to you, they make it sincerely and fully 
even if it seems like it's distant and far away. And Ya Allah, when they complain, we complain with the facts and ask for your help. Speaking of that, the last thing I'll share with you is a verse of the Qur'an talking about Satana Maryam that many people have asked about. Because in the process of her birthing, Sayyidina Isa, she says something that many people have asked about. What did she say? Ya laytani mittu qabla hadha wa kuntu nasyan nansiyya. Hmm. Oh Allah. I wish that I had died before this moment and I was a thing forgotten. Hmm. People have asked all kinds of questions about this. They've said, is this not a kind of i'tirad or, or kind of objection to what Allah has sent her? People have said, is this her feeling a little suicidal? People have asked, is this that she's very down? Is this her not wanting what's coming her way? All kinds of questions, all kinds of questions. And I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, they're all good questions. What does the tafsir say? What does the tafsir say? Here it says very clearly from the scholars that have explained this, they have said this is not her trying to say that she doesn't want this to happen or her objecting on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sending her the fate that he has sent her. Rather, this is basically a very painful and test and a very painful experience that is testing her as a human and part of her humanness, if you will. In Tafsir ibn Kathir, he says that this, her saying that she wished to be unknown or forgotten or that no one knew where she, who she was, is referring to the fact that she um, w was calling out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was a cry of pain. It was a cry of difficulty. It wasn't a, oh Allah, make me dead. It was more of a cry of saying, this is hard. And that is very human. And that is very human. And so I want to remind us all that if you have a very difficult time like this too, or something happens in which you feel, wish that you maybe didn't, uh, didn't want to be here anymore, or something to that effect, please know that we do want you here, first of all. And second of all, that pain is a real thing. And people much better than us experience that pain. For some, Allah has given the provisions to carry them through it. For others, they need their friends and their family and their community to carry them through it. And for others, and you know I'm not going to leave you without saying this, and for others, you need the help of those who are trained to help you get through something like this. My sisters, Satina Maryam radiallahu anha and her own mother, Hannah, both made intense du'as, very sincere du'as. They were women of righteousness. They were women of worship. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested them greatly. And he tested their very iman. And he tested them with the things that were the most difficult for them. And Allah will test us with the things that are difficult for us. And it's not about the test. It's about how we respond to the test. It's not about the test. So remind yourself, it's not about the test. It's about how we respond to the test. And when you respond the way these beautiful women responded, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates you. He gives you the provisions. He sees you through. And he even sends you those who will defend you. Right? Defend your honor, defend your name, defend you without you having to say a thing. He also tells us through all of the stories that we talked about today that you can't actually do this alone. In each of these stories, you see here, people show up. For Satina, the, the du'a that Sayyidah Hannah made, her daughter, which ended up being a daughter, couldn't go to the temple completely by herself. Sayyidina Zakaria showed up and took care of her and watched over her. And when Satina Maryam 
had her difficulty and her test show up. Allah sent the Archangel Jibreel himself <laughs> to talk to Sittina Maryam, and then he made the water come and the dates come, and he gave a miracle, miracles. This child was miraculous and spoke and defended. So Sayyidina Isa himself becomes the one who defends Sittina Maryam. Sisters, we can't do this alone. We can't do life alone. And for some, and I'll say it again, what I said earlier, I'm going to reiterate it one more time, so bear with me. For some, Allah carries them through some of your tests. You don't need more than that. Other tests Allah sends you, he sends you people who show up. Your Sayyidina Yahya's and your Sayyidina Isa's and people of your life who show up to help you. Your friends, your family, your neighbors, people that are going to carry you, the community. And other times, all of these things may not fully hold you. And so he sends you the people of knowledge who know what to do. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. I'll end, yes? I'll end with the verse of the Qur'an, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says clearly, If you do not know, then ask the people of knowledge. فَاسْأَلُوا أَهْلَ الذِّكْرِ إِن كُنْتُمْ لَا تَعْلَمُونَ Ask the people of knowledge if you do not know. I can't in good faith send you off today from today's lecture since we touched on so many things related to spiritual health and spiritual wellness and mental and emotional health and mental and emotional wellness and also physical for that matter, <laughs> subhanAllah. In good faith without telling you, sisters, please make sure you seek out appropriate care and help to see you through your tests and tribulations. Sometimes they are just Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone and your dua and your prayers and your iman. Sometimes you need the people that Allah sends you and sometimes we need the people of knowledge. And the people of knowledge here means those who have trained and have helped, have learned. Sometimes they are the shiyukh, the shaykhat, the people who have studied the ilm to answer your questions. So you don't go to your mechanic to ask a fiqh question about Ramadan. Likewise, you don't go to your plumber when you're depressed. My sisters, Allah sends us all the provisions we need and answers all the du'as in due time. But know how you respond is how exactly it is that is answered. And so inshallah, before we leave, please again renew, this is our third one, right? Renew the intention, ya Allah. Make me a woman of the Qur'an. Make this month of the Qur'an, Ramadan, a month in which I devote it to the Qur'an. And allow me, ya Rabbil Alameen, to someone who, who becomes someone who can understand it read it fluently, practice what it says, and Ya Rabbi, be like the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, a walking, talking Qur'an. Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen, Allahumma ameen. What a pleasure to be here with all of you today. Barakallahu fikun, walhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.